Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Cheeky Natives. Um, I have a very special guest here today. I know I say this with every single podcast, but all of our guests are very, very special. That's why they're on the Cheeky Natives. But we have the esteemed Ntikeng Muhlele, who is on today's podcast, which we're recording live at the Bridge Books on Commissioner Street. So I just wanted to read Ntikeng's um bio and you'll hear why a little bit later so his bio says that he was partly raised in Limpopo in Timbisa and attended the University of the Witwatersrand where he obtained a BA in Dramatic Arts, Publishing Studies and African Literature. He is the author of four critically acclaimed novels, The Sense of Bliss, Small Things, Rusty Ball, Pleasure and Now Michael K. Pleasure won the 2016 University of Johannesburg Main Prize for South African Writing in English as well as the 2017 K. Silodeka Memorial Prize at the South African Literary Awards. It has also been long listed for the International Dublin Literary Award. Michael K. is Mukhlele's fifth novel. And with an introduction like that, we can only be so grateful to have you on The Cheeky Natives. Welcome once again, Nancy King. Thank you. Um, so I'm always very curious as to how authors would describe themselves. Like, there's a bio that exists, and I think at the back of every book, the blurb exists and we're told about who you are, but how would you describe who Ntikeng Mushele is? I'm just a bloke. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to be honest, I, I'm, I'm a human being. I'm a South African. I guess I'm a black man of middle age <laughs> uh, who is fascinated about the arts in their totality. Mm. And I'm a husband, father, and a brother and a son to my mother. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so, Ntiging, I when I was reading this book, uh, which is Michael K., you spoke in a lot of interviews about some literary influences that you've had. Um, and I'm, I'm quite curious as to who your literary influences are before we get into, into the actual book. Uh, who would you list as your literary influences? And I asked this particularly in light of the uh, foreword that was written to you by Zayton Da, which is amazing. Um, so who would you list as your literary influences? I'd list all this esteemed uh, panel here. <laughs> uh, obviously, I would think, or maybe not so obvious, uh, and it needs to be stated, mm-hmm. I am influenced by my contemporaries mm-hmm. because they are colleagues. Um, so it would be Yolanda, it would be Nick, um, from or uh, it would be Zooks, you know. Um, from that point of view, mm. uh, it would be Sue. Um, people that I work with, we dealing with almost um, the same social context in, in real time. Um, it is very, very important for me to be able to engage uh, either in conversation or through artworks with my what I would call my contemporaries. Um, I think the list is very long to mm-hmm. list, um, you know, uh, in similar form. Mm-hmm. But it's the African literature canon, mm-hmm. right? so that is important for context and for uh, identity and expression of self mm-hmm. and self-realization. Mm-hmm. Because you know, it's not a fluke that all these important books were written on the continent. So that is important, primarily. Before I go to your Philip Roths and your James Baldwin's, mm-hmm. your Alex Haley's, your Dan Buzzo, um, Javier Marie, for instance, JMC himself, and I know that there are issues around there, uh, which, um, you know, it's okay. <laughs> um, uh, Wale, Shoyinka. Um, and, and, and Tony Morrison, mm. Alice Walker, those kinds of, 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 of writers. And um, Saul Bellow, uh, Albert Camus, mm. those kinds of, 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 of writers. Is there a book or books that you think have particularly shaped the way that you write? Is there a book that you sit back and you read and you think, I wish I had written that book? Uh, not necessarily books, coins, uh, 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 strangely, it's music. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that reference would be kind of blue. The Miles Davis album. Okay. Uh, 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 kind of blue. Because I think of 
literature mm -hmm. not in an exclusive mm -hmm. manner. I think of literature as as part of artistic disciplines. Mm -hmm. So they are not mutually exclusive to me, right? So film, uh, theater, I always say that, uh, music, um, and books mm -hmm. for me, um, including performance poetry and what have you, I see them as part of a mm -hmm. cyclical mm -hmm. continuum. Okay. Right. So it would be kind of blue because it is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful album. And if I were to bring it closer to home, it would be Simpiwedana, it would be Mam Throng, uh, it would be uh, Tandiswa, King mm -hmm. Tai's music, um, because it's important for context and for self-actualization, mm -hmm. if I were to call it that. It's okay to admire everything else outside of the immediate context, but I think you need to be rooted to be able to appreciate um, other things elsewhere in the world. Uh, so the tagline for Avandu Book Fest is reimagining ourselves into, into existence. And you've spoken a lot about self-actualization and, and the need for context. Why, why do you think that self-actualization is... So the question really would be, what do you think is the role of the black writer in South Africa in the reimagining of ourselves into a new existence? Um, I've got a contradictory answer for you. Okay. I don't think we should have too much on black writer. Mm. It should be writer period first, mm. human being first, mm. period. Black comes in because of systematic mm -hmm. exclusions that have happened over time, cultural um, exploitation, mm -hmm. and exploitation on every single level on the black body. So the stance has been able, that of um, reclaiming mm -hmm. that and reprojection that which is positive within black artistic practice and black life uh, for, for, for that matter and not everything that is black from where I sit uh, is reducible to art mm -hmm. and I don't think that black people here and in the diaspora should continue um, thinking about this imposed otherness mm -hmm. on, on, on blackness for me I just find it extremely irritating uh, from where I am sitting. Part of what we see, uh, we had a whole uh, movement of literature that was anti-colonial mm. literature. Then we had the post-colonial Africa and elsewhere, including in the diaspora, that formed a whole identity of literary or artistic output based on a defense of self mm. and preservation of self and um, a correction of uh, a myriad of prejudices that uh, were aimed at undermining um, blackness. And when I say blackness, it's black innovation, black thought, black creative output, uh, black cultures, as well as uh, black identities. I think that's such an interesting point to make about about the, the field of black literature as a whole, right? Yeah. Uh, Toni Morrison often talks about this, how she feels that that the works of black writers have been treated as an anthropological study. They're not treated as critical work that is that is literature, that is art. You know, they treat it as this anthropological study and it's there's a gaze that exists in which we look at, at the works of people who happen to be black but who are also writers. I mean, often if you think about it, we'd never ever say a white writer, you know, by, by virtue of existence oh, you assume that, you, that, you're, you, that you're a writer, you know, it's like a female rapper. Um, so I, you studied a BA and you did dramatic arts, you did publishing studies and you also did um, African literature. Have you always known that you're going to be a writer? Yes, I've always known that. Um, even though I didn't know the how of it mm -hmm. or how long it would actually take. But I've always known that I'm going to be a writer. First with um, when I read Things Fall Apart, mm -hmm. it made a very deep impression on me how that book was written. And the last line, the 
pacification of the primitive tribes of the lower Niger. It took me a while to understand it. Um, but when I did, I just caught on. And I was taught by very intelligent people. You couldn't make a half-baked um, argument. Mm -hmm. They would stretch you to breaking point in terms of what proper reading is, mm -hmm. what proper reflection is, what problematizing um, interlinked and mm -hmm. divergent um, philosophical, cultural, anthropological, social, tropes mm -hmm. entailed and that was very empowering. I'm, I'm very curious as to what was your family's reaction to you having wanted to be a writer. Often we, I think especially for Africans, there's a, and I always find this funny because I, I have the career that's one of the African family careers, um, but you know African families often think of you having a proper job when you are a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant or an engineer. And, and I've found that often we don't, we don't have a respect for the arts as being a career. What, what was your family's reaction to the, to the idea that you wanted to be a writer? I come from a family of mainly um, illiterate people, mm -hmm. let me put it that way, uh, but very supportive people. They are illiterate in the academic sense of what an education is. Mm -hmm. But when you look at life, wisdom around life and being in existence, I would put my family right there at the very top. So um, they embraced the fact that I wanted to write. I had a job there and I still do now. So um, the support has been very consistent and they've embraced what I do and they get very happy every time that a book comes out or a poster is in town, or uh, there's coverage in the press. Mm -hmm. um, it's a moment of great pride to them. My mother doesn't read, but I read my books to her. Mm -hmm. right? I skip all the weird parts, <laughs> uh, diplomatically. Um, not because of any sense of deception, mm -hmm. but because I was raised in a culture where you have to be decent around your parents. That is a given, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You have to respect the, 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 how do I put it, the fundamentals. So there are lines that one does not cross. And the fact that one went to vets and you have the privilege of being a writer and whatever, mm -hmm. does not mean you forget who you are uh, as a person. And I'll still get the same message to her, but I must be very diplomatic in how I do that. Yeah. So earlier on, um, I asked you, I mean, you're, this is your fifth book that you've published, which is an amazing feat, considering the publishing industry that we have and, and all of the connotations that sort of exist around buying of certain writers' books. And, and, and. Um, and I asked you earlier if there was a, a moment in which you felt that you had become a writer. And, and just for the benefits of everybody who's listening to this, because I thought that that was such a poignant response that you gave, um, I'd just like you to, to repeat that. Um, I am a very total person. Mm. Right? If I drop dead in the next 16 seconds, mm. I would have no regrets. I live my life discreetly, mm. but very fully. But to answer you more, more directly, I don't look at literature as this is the body of work of what I've created. Yay. I'm not that kind of person. Each project is very, very, very important to me. And I treat it as a complete universe in and of itself. Right? The fact that there are other books uh, that are written by me, it's purely progression. But each world of each book that I create is very um, unique mm. to me from an experience point of view. So a more short and direct answer is um, I've always felt that I'm a writer with everything that I've created, even with an SMS <laughs> for that matter. Mm. I think I place the same weight of being and presence and consciousness, even in a WhatsApp that I sent to something. Because I don't see why it should be different. Obviously, and um, 
in a book it would be a much more heightened and conscious thing but I don't think one should just say now I'm serious I'm writing a book uh, and mm. and because being an artist and a writer is not a freak accident it's a state of being mm. for me yeah. you've described yourself as almost obsessive you know in, in the way in which you go about in writing your books mm. what is what does that entail so so real so really the question is when you are set, settling down to write a book that you describe as this total process what what does it involve for you um, it involves forethought it involves passion it involves a quest for self betterment mm -hmm. it involves uh, heightened consciousness about the world around me um, may I have said obsessive yes maybe I have not broken it down mm -hmm. um, obsessive people would look at some fanatical application of energy at a level of intensity and that's not what I mean I'm saying obsessive because it is a great responsibility creating art and it's a great privilege uh, creating art it's not something that you just put out there because uh, you can I'm saying obsessive from a point of view of necessary care that needs to be put in place uh, so that I don't embarrass my peers, wherever <laughs> I am. They say, that one says he's a writer. Mm, mm. Oh, you should have just been a chef or something. You know? <laughs> I don't know why you want to be counted with us. Mm, and there's mm. a lot of competent writers in this country. And you see, I don't have to tell you. Yeah, in our audience, those of you who are not here. She, she was, she was, lo uh, 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 was uh, long-listed with me, by the way. She's on the short list now. And I'm rooting for her to mm -hmm. kick some <laughs> butt. And, and, and as, a, as an aside, <laughs> hey, the money, yeah. as an aside, I'm, I'm yeah. not one for name dropping or anything, but yeah. I do want to, to let you know that the she that Tsigeng is referring to is Yewande Omotoso, mm -hmm. who is in the audience today. So if you don't come today, you've missed out. You're in the presence of a lot of greatness. Mm -hmm. And I just want to remind everybody who didn't come mm -hmm. that they have missed out on being just in the audience of, like you're, you're saying, great contemporaries around you. Earlier on this year, we had Shalja Patel on the show, and um, we were talking about, about literature as a, as a form of activism, you know, and how there's been a great criticism of, of art, and of literature, and I guess art as a totality, that uh, art will not solve the world's problems. So yes, it's great that people are putting out work, and it's wonderful that people are writing books, and, and releasing music, but art will not solve the world's problems. You know, STEM is going to do that. And and, and what is your counter as a, as a writer to, to the concept that that literature, as great and as wonderful as it is, that art will not in any meaningful way change the condition of the world? I strongly disagree with that stance. Mm -hmm. um, because if art were not that important, mm -hmm and not changing anything, there would be no bookshops, there would be no museums, there would be no cinemas, there would be no Shakespeare, there would be no poets, there would not have been a renaissance, there would not be African sculpture, I always say, there would not be African music, classified as world music, I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> So it is a partially, at a very granular and meager level, a possible sentiment that art would not solve some problems directly. But art is very important in enriching lives of people, of cultures, of societies, of history and of heritage, because if you don't have those themes that I'm speaking to now, then it's a very empty human life. So um, there is spiritual importance that uh, art brings to societies. There's a social consciousness that art brings to things. And there is um, cerebral engagement in terms of problems that solve society, uh, that plague societies, and not only from a point of looking at art in what is it able to solve, we must also look at what 
art contributes to societies and it contributes beauty. That is an important thing to have beauty in society. It 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 it, it promotes um, how can I put it over and above beauty uh, a reflection on those societies to be able to 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 look at themselves. One cannot say that a film like Amistad, for instance, or Roots, or Schindler's List, for instance, or even the really terribly made um, Cry Freedom, because of just the weighting of the story, Donald Woods versus the supposed main character, Bantubiko, in the thing, that those are not important and that they don't solve. I think it's a lazy statement and it's, it's reckless, uh, maybe not intended, but I think it demands far greater thought than it's being afforded. So your first novel was published in 2008, which is 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> how do you think that the, the publishing industry has changed um, in the 10 years that you've experienced since your, first, since your first novel to now? And I guess the greater question is, there's been a massive conversation that's been had about how, um, firstly, there's, there's an idea that black readers don't buy books or black people don't read. Um, but also, secondly, that, that uh, a lot of people have felt that the publishing industry continues to, in many, in many respects, um, make it difficult for black writers to be published, for, for arts that's written by black people to, to receive them the sort of attention that it deserves. Uh, and how do you, how do you, how do you respond to, to those kind of questions? Um, it's a mouthful. There are difficult questions to deal with. But we must not confuse a plethora of complementary and divergent mm -hmm. themes to be wholesome. Because mm -hmm. in your questions, there are commercial considerations. Mm -hmm. Publishers are in business. That's what we must think about. There are policy issues in terms of your arts and culture department, mm -hmm. which I believe humbly that a lot needs to be done in terms of promotion and support of the arts and innovation in uh, policy instruments that enable artists to be able to enter the publishing mainstream, uh, for instance. Uh, Black people don't buy books, that is not true. Mm -hmm. It's another reckless statement. Mm -hmm. Black people read. Mm -hmm. I was taught by black professors. They refer me to a whole lot of other black people mm -hmm. who read other white people, who <laughs> read Chinese people, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. have been, have their horizons um, broadened by Cambodian writers, mm -hmm. Argentinian writers, Spanish writers. See where I'm going with this. There is a tendency, which is very unfortunate, to lump a lot of issues that need unpacking mm. into one singular problem, as if it's not. Every problem is multi-dimensional, as mm. far as I'm concerned. So um, a publisher might say, I am not going to publish A, B, C, D, and whatever because I'm working with these strained margins and what have you. How has it changed? I think it's evolving. Mm -hmm. uh, it still does not pay writers nearly enough for what it takes to be an author. Um, and, and that is a problem. And it's a problem also at a policy level. right? Um, we have a lot of celebratory jamborees of music and DJs and what have you, <laughs> which, is, which is fine. Mm. And I've got nothing against DJs, and I need to just be succinct and clear. Mm. But um, I can assure you that those uh, multiple disciplines need to be coordinated in how they are rewarded and what it takes to actually participate in that, uh, in, in that space. Having said that, it's important to caution people that writing should not be done only for money motives, mm. but it is important to respect the labor uh, of, of writers and artists like <coughs> everyone else's mm. uh, writer is, 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 is respected. If I needed an op, 
it's not going to be cheap. If I went to an orthodont, uh, ortho, uh, what do you call orthodontist? It? Orthodontist. I'm mm. wearing braces, as you can see. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not cheap, <laughs> but people want freebies from yes. from 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 writers. And I, when I put my braces on, uh, just under two years ago, mm -hmm. they told me it's gonna cost forty five rand, forty five thousand rand, and. I thought I didn't hear properly, <laughs> and, and, and it turned out to be very true. And I found my medical aid, and I had a 45-minute discussion mm. on why mm. um, it was not a medical aid. <laughs> but, uh, mm. but you yeah. see where I'm going. And this is a very interesting point that you've just made, and it takes me back to a conversation Zulisa and I had recently where she spoke about it's so great to be able to name drop and have the people in the audience uh, i just want to put that out there it's really great to be like oh i was out with Zugi, so and i and i guess that's a just as an aside that's a large sort of change i think that the chief nurses is able to appreciate i i don't know if 15 years ago you know people who looked like me um and so Zuisa recounts being in, it was in Leave, where they have a writer on the currency. And, and just that has stuck with me forever, that mm -hmm. they have a writer on, on the currency, that they, they are so respectful and so appreciative of the art of writing, that they have, uh, they had a writer on the currency, they had places they had named, university. they had a university okay. named after a writer. You, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing busts of writers and of people who've contributed to the literature in the Ukraine. And, and for me, it's, it's, always so, it's always so sad to hear South African write, great South African writers who are recognized by, by people outside of, of, of South Africa, you know, receiving all of this credit and acclaim and, and the realization that we don't place that same amount of, of respect for, for literature in this country. And I, I'm curious as to when, when you say that you believe that uh, we need to pay more respect to to writers and we need to give more support to writers what does that look like for you well there are millions and millions of rents that get allocated to departments mm. right you cannot look at an education system in my view mm. i am not a policy maker mm. um, I am not a president, I'm, I'm an artist, mm. but I don't think you can look at an education, revival mm. and development of an edu education system in, away from an important discipline like literature and writing, uh, for instance. Uh, there is a lot of um, writer residencies that get offered from other localities around the mm. world to South African writers. People have to go freeze in some snow <laughs> in some foreign country somewhere, mm. and yet they pay taxes, mm. right? They pay taxes, and the moment Zukiswa <coughs> or Sue, mm. you know, and Yowande wins the Nobel Prize mm. one day, and that's when you'd see them in broadsheets that, oh, these people are important. They'll mm. be on every television show, one and that and that. And, and I will refuse to appear on those shows. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 it, and it's sad. Mm. And I'm not saying this out of protest or mm. of defiance. It's just decency and common sense mm. from where I sit. Because I don't believe that there is not money in the fiscus, right? Um, I don't want to go, go get, to get into the Gupta issues because just on that alone, I don't know how many writers you can have funded. And I, I think as somebody who is not a writer, I think particularly for me, over and over again, I see the importance of having a population that is that is literate and well read, you know, and it goes it goes beyond the idea that it's nice for people to read books, but there 
there is something that reading empowers you with as a person that extends into so many other aspects of your life that that completely changes how you behave almost in certain ways. So we talk about how certain books will have an impression on you. I, I remember reading Things Fall Apart and that for me was like the first education. Like, wait, actually things haven't always been like that and, and that probed, that probed a deeper interest into into an understanding of, of certain, of other issues. And I think it's always very interesting for me to hear authors continuously lament the same things. And I think that it's an indictment on us just as a society that even in 2018, like extremely talented writers in this country are still not receiving the support that they need. And it, and it does call for, for an innovation, for an innovation and an innovative way for us to look at, at publishing and at writing and at reading in this country. So I'm actually also just very curious about um, the books. You've, you've mentioned a lot of like literary influences and books that, you, that you've read that have a deep impression on you. So I guess my question is, and I always ask our, our guests this, that if you had a 16-year-old that you wanted to recommend five books to, that you wanted them to read these five books, and you felt that these five books would set them well on the on the path in life what five books would you would you recommend this young 16 year old to read and why would you recommend those books uh, i would give them a difficult assignment mm -hmm. i would say i've got five books that i want to recommend to you mm -hmm. but before i do that recommendation go read all the work of every contemporary South African writer working today. Mm. Make sure that you know it back to front. Mm -hmm. Once you have done that, I know that the home base is covered. Mm. Then, <laughs> then, then, what then, a task for a 16 year old. <laughs> yeah, then, then I would say read Things Fall Apart. Mm -hmm. Then uh, read Detained. Mm -hmm. um, I would say read It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult one. I'd say read Kefa Boy, mm. Mark Matabani. Mm. I'd say read um, the poetry of Gurapets, Khosetzile, mm. Prof Khosetzile, and read it over a lifetime. Mm. Not read it and put it aside, read it, revisit it for as long as the, you have time and a mind and eyes to be able to, to, to read, right? Um, I would say, read Marachera. Mm. Mm. And I would say Marachera as a theme, which means you won't read House of Hunger or <laughs> Mind Blast or, you know, mm. Black Sunlight and the poetry, mm. or the interviews, including the self-interview, right? Um, so from that point of view, I would say that is very, very, very uh, 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 important. Mm -hmm. And by that time, they won't be able to pass metric because <laughs> they've been so focused on doing it. And by that time, they are no longer 16. <laughs> I mean, just reading all of Tambuz or Marucheva. Um, so I actually wanted to now get into... Michael K, which is your, your latest book. Um, firstly, congratulations on the amazing launch on, on Thursday. Um, social media was alight. Everybody was just tweeting. It was, it was amazing to see the kind of reception that you've had. Um, and I, 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 I'm actually just very curious about, about that, that do you, five books, and do you still get overwhelmed by, by having that kind of reception or I mean as somebody who's always imagined themselves as a writer is are you almost expectant of that considering the kind of labor and the work that you put into into your books? Um, I'm going to take four steps back okay. <laughs> to answer your question. Okay. I am not overwhelmed by the responses that I get for the work that I do. Mm. And I know that at face value that might seem like a cocky answer mm. or an arrogant answer. It's not intended to be like that. I am extremely confident in what I do mm. as a person. There is no reason that I that surpasses all the stars that adorn the heavens. <laughs> Why I should not be confident in what I do? Mm. Because people have been killed. Mm over centuries mm. 
just for the right to exist mm. as whole human, human beings. Mm. And if you read 491, for instance, yeah. Mam Wini's story, they, there would be absolutely no reason uh, for there to not be total faith mm. and total appreciation of the privilege. It's a great privilege mm. to be able to write and to create uh, because too many um, unacceptable prices have been paid mm. by, by, by people here in this country mm. and on the wider continent. Mm. And it would be, for me, very futile for any young person in South Africa or on the continent to feel that there is even the slightest mm. dash mm. of uh, inferiority mm. in the life paths that they set mm. for themselves. So it is something that I am very conscious of and um, I only try my very best to do to write uh, the best work that I can mm. write, but that is not sufficient. I have to also believe in the thing that mm. I do, because then people have to uh, pick up from where I left mm. off when the book leaves my desk and is, is, is in shops and what have you. I don't think, and this would sound a bit extreme, mm. that anyone has got a right in this country and mm. elsewhere to walk around with slump shoulders and a bowed head for nobody. Mm. And for that I mean it, and I actually even take it personal. If uh, I f someone expects me to justify what I do, I don't, I, I, I don't. And for someone who might read it as cocky, mm. my suggestion would say, please go inspect the history of South Africa and how we got where we are, and the history of the world, mm. and exploitation everywhere else where there are human beings. Yeah. So, with regards to um, Michael K, um, so the blurb says that this work was written in response to James Kutzia's classic masterpiece, Life and Times of Michael K. Ntike Mushele dabbles in the artistic and speculative in a unique attempt to unpack the dazed and disconnected world of the title character, his solitary ways, his inventiveness, but also to show how astutely Michael Kay holds up a mirror to those whose paths he inadvertently crosses. Michael Kay explores the weight of history and of conscience, thus wrestling the character from the confines of literary creation to the frontiers of artistic timelessness. Uh, uh, in writing about this book, said that this is a work of reflective intensity, reimagining a memorable character from James Kutia's world of stark and sparse prose and transplanting him into Mukhele's ornate and lyrical one. Um, so you, you were asked recently um, as to whether you, you were not nervous about writing about this, this book, which has such a, a massive uh, literary following, um, and reimagining it, and you were, you were asked in an interview recently whether you felt um, any sort of pressure, you know, from James Kutia's fans or fans of the book in writing this book, and I, I think that you've answered that question um, quite succinctly in the, in the preceding answer. So what I do actually want to talk about is the, is the book itself. Um, firstly, your, the writing in this book is absolutely amazing. This is such a beautifully written book. Um, Eusebius, who I feel like stole my words, but he actually didn't because he said them first, described your writing as being lyrical without, without being ethereal. And I think that is absolutely the best way to, to sort of describe the way in which you've written this book. Uh, I think that anybody who's reading the book is actually transplant, is transported to, to, to Dust Island, to Johannesburg, you're sipping the coffee, you're laughing at Professor von Ludwig, and that is, that is just a testament to, to the absolute work that, you, that you've put in into crafting what is an, an amazing response. Um, there are a lot of themes that you explore in the book, and um, I actually just wanted to expand on them. So, death. Is, is, a, is a theme that comes up often in, in, in the book. Um, 
And I'm curious as to why you want the death to to be one of sort of the focal themes of of this book. Was this a commentary on your own feelings about about death, about also illness and and the and and I guess mortality as a as a whole? I read a lot of um, existential philosophy okay. or philosophy in general. Mm. And I like the way it illuminates different uh, aspects of the life continuum. And um, I think it was Camus who said something about suicide as the ultimate, I don't remember the exact um, you know, phrasing of it, but it's to the effect that, you know, um, self power of self in what to do with your own life must be like the ultimate, uh, how uh, do I put it, uh, expression uh, of self. Uh, health is part of being, and I don't refer here only to bodily health, but also spiritual health. And um, those are themes that I come to uh, because the world is premised on life, but on death too. The reason that you've got the Security Council is precisely because countries have industrialized death. And that is why in geopolitics mm. and in international relations, there is so many uh, issues and discussions around nuclear pro proliferation for instance. That is a death factor. The fact that it's not operating doesn't mean it's not there. Mm. Some dumb person just needs to push a button mm. and wipe out people. It's the burden of disease in countries and whether they have the wherewithal to be able to actually protect citizens and what have you. Um, it's also a death of ideas. You know. Um, and dictatorships around the world is a certain level of death as far as I am concerned. But I'm saying, uh, like light uh, and darkness, life and death coexist um, as important things in, 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 in um, life. Other pe for other people, it takes different manifestations. For people that are very religious, mm -hmm. the death of Christ is an important marker. And he has risen is another important mark. Yeah, so it's from that point of view that I engage with these things. Um, illness also also makes a, an appearance as a as a focal theme in this book. And there's there's a scene which prompted me to to wonder about your own feelings about euthanasia and and your feelings around people determining determining the course of their own illnesses. Have you grappled with, with that sort of as a theme in your own personal life? I'm, I'm curious as to why this came up so profoundly in this book, especially. Um, it's a difficult one to answer. Um, have there been personal sentiments of ill health in my own personal life? Um, I'm going to sidestep that question mm -hmm. uh, for reasons that are personal mm -hmm. rather than, you know, uh, artistic. Mm -hmm. But as an artist, I have witnessed a lot of suffering mm -hmm. uh, brought about in part by people being unwell. Mm -hmm. Have I had near-death experiences? Yes, I have. But I'll just not go into, 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 into details. And I think that, to be fair, it would be disingenuous to say portions of personal experiences do not, in some backdoor kind of way, or in small sentiment uh, ways, um, make it into the art that one creates. But what, whether I want to illuminate that freely is another story altogether. Um, there's a passage that I'd, yeah. <laughs> I think everyone wants you to read from this passage. Um, <laughs> because you might not, uh, you might just not look at, at a certain food stuff the same. Oh. <laughs> 
Let's having oh. having read from from this from this passage, I just need to. I think you know the passage that I'm talking about. I have no idea. Who knows the page number? Eighteen. I'm on page eighteen. Yes. Um, that that I'm talking about. So I just wanted to make a to make to prelude before we before we read on a on a lighter note. I think that everybody is going to be asking us again to to read from this passage because you like I'm saying you it it speaks to to the kind of writing that you can expect to find in this book. But it, it also just speaks to the way in which you, you make looking at what might be just a mundane, you know, ordinary day of everyday thing, not necessarily um, appear that way. So I'd just like to ask that you please read uh, from page 80 for the benefit of our readers, who of course will go out and buy the book. My, just my, my wife is going to listen to this podcast, you know. <laughs> uh, this is a, a content warning for uh, Tiging's wife. Uh, she can just skip over this part. And, uh, <laughs> okay, from where? So I just like you to read from here, so from this last part. Okay. Just to him. Okay. <laughs> I will read this famous passage. <laughs> That seems to be overshadowing this book. <laughs> <laughs> Not overshadowing, illuminating okay. the book. All right, let's, let's say that seems to illuminate <laughs> part of this book. Okay. Um, um, she is a child, man. Besides, our relationship is strictly professional. Although this, of course, was not strictly true. I so desired Maureen that I at times temporarily lost my mind, any sense of restraint that I imagined with a sudden swell of emotions and enlightenment how desperately I craved Greek salad, cucumbers, lettuce, onion rings, and baby tomatoes, only dressed with her springs her womanly eruptions resultant from our imagined carnal sieges. I, on occasions, at obscure restaurants, still order Greek salad for its erotic rather than dietary qualities. And when salad dressings are presented as options, which Maureen was around to squat over the bowl, let loose her precious leeks, that I would pounce on her and show her that the devil existed and when she moaned and fluttered, regained my composure by fisting on my salad, she would have been too kind to irrigate. What would be profounder, what could be profounder than that, when I literally and figuratively ate her, ingested her mysterious waters, and then used her panties as a napkin? After reading a passage like that, how can Greek salad ever look the same to you again? <laughs> um, so love is also a theme that comes that comes up often in in this book. But I, I found it interesting the way that you you portrayed the the romantic relationships. I'm particularly interested in the relationship between Buidumelo and and Prof von von Ludwig, which which is both passionate but also sometimes a little bit a little bit distant. Um, can you just expand on on the theme of love in 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 relation to this this book? Mm-hmm. <coughs> I think it's a it's an ancient orchestration of the love theme. Mm. It's Romeo and Juliet in mm. another light, really, you know. And uh, from where I'm sitting, if you looked at relationships that are perfect, they're nice to admire. Mm. Uh, but literature is drama. <laughs> Story is mm. drama. Mm. And it's when the sparks fly mm. and when things go wrong, when there's a loss of equilibrium, that art becomes interesting at least for me, mm. from how I see it. Mm. And so perfectly drawn characters and the scenarios that they live in mm. is not necessarily interesting for me, mm. because then it's lacking in the charge that make human beings imperfect, an, an imperfect mm. species, uh, as it were. 
and because human beings have got different yearnings, even if they're united by like uh, minded pursuits mm. like romantic engagements. Mm. So, uh, with regards to the character developments in the book, so Michael M is, he's the title character, um, but he, in effect, makes a cameo, cameo appearance in the in the book. I mean, so in the first part of the book, I, without giving away too much, because we want everyone who's just heard of page eighty, it's going by the rest of the book. Um, uh, he he makes an appearance in the in the beginning of the book, but then the book goes on to. Had to be narrated by Miles M. And there were a lot of jazz sort of references in the book. And, I was, and, and while reading the book, I was actually wondering if the title character was you paying homage to, to Miles Davies, or is it just an interesting literary coincidence that the title character is named mm. Miles M? Uh, Miles M is my son. Mm. I named him after Miles Davis mm. because I love the music of Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. And so progressive are my parents that they universally said, go ahead, mm -hmm. he's your child, <laughs> which, which was, was lit. I, I like that and I love that about, mm. about them. And so, yeah, I think that's a personal... Not yeah, mm. yeah, I think so. Professor von Ludwig is a, is a very interesting character. He's this professor of, of philosophy who holds some very interesting views about a variety of topics. And poetry is one of the, the topics that he often goes into in-depth um, you know, characterization on. Um, and poetry often makes an appearance in this book over and over again, which, which just had me wondering if there is a, there's an anthology somewhere inside of you. Um, I write poetry mm -hmm. informally, mm -hmm. I read a lot of poetry, mm -hmm. but poetry is music. I love music and I listen to a lot of music as well. So I think it's, it's, um, it embellishes mm -hmm. sensory worlds, as it were. Uh, would I write, a, 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 would I have a poetry anthology one day? Um, too soon to tell. Mm -hmm. we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Okay, I can take that. We'll yeah. Stay tuned. Yeah. Um, so, philosophy, you've spoken about the fact that you read a lot of existential philosophy. Was making Professor von Ludwig a professor of, of philosophy a nod to, to, that, to that era of your life? I, I think he could have been a professor of anything. I just found it particularly interesting in this context, having read the book, that he was a professor of, of philosophy. Uh, and often, sorry, just as an aside, and often says the most poetic things in the book, as opposed to Miles M, who is sitting with this inner poet that we have yet to see. Professor von Ludwig often says very poetic things, despite the fact that he's a, a professor of philosophy. Yeah, okay. I think that um, literature and philosophy mm -hmm. are siblings mm -hmm. from where I'm sitting. Mm -hmm. um, Gustav van Ludwig, the character in, in Michael K, mm. has very much grown around real life mm. poets. Mm. So he understands sensibilities uh, that mm. define the life of poets. And yet his passion is actually philosophy. Mm. Philosophy, I think, is a narrative device as well to be mm. able to unpack ideas mm. um, that. Um, would have been heavy, mm. was it not actually orchestrated in such a way that you had an, a philosopher presenting that, those ideas. If you want effective, quiet, um, discreet mm. fighting of a war, army generals deploy snipers. So Van Ludwig is my sniper mm. uh, in the book because there's no machine gun fire, per se, mm -hmm. but I think that it's effective. He is. Um, so, so Miles M, who is the, who's narrating the story, uh, settles in, in Johannesburg, and so location in this book is, is very interesting. We move from 
being in Dust Island to to being in Johannesburg and even when we're in Johannesburg, there are very different locations that are that are described. Um, and I, I'm curious, I mean, so he could have moved anyway to become to find his inner poet, you know? And I mean, why why did you particularly choose him to come to Joburg? I think that we, often when we think of Joburg, you think of this place where people come to to make their dreams come true. Joburg is for the hustle, it's where it's where you make things happen. Miles M moves to Joburg to find his inner poet. Um, and that's that's just very an, a very interesting sort of choice of location for me. Um, yes, because there's a lot of energy to the city, mm. and there is a historic significance mm. to the city as well. And I think that things happen in Johannesburg because it is what it is. So I don't think there's any complicated mm. metaphoric mm. interpretations of signifier mm. and signifieds and this and that. Mm. Joburg is just cool. But <laughs> <laughs> So Miles then uh, comes to, to Joburg because he wants to pursue this passion, but without giving away too much of, of the plot, um, the, the passion sort of doesn't come, come to pass, you know? Um, but what is, what is interesting is, is the fact that Miles M is also a government employee. And in a, in a prior interview that you had, you said that one of the themes that you wanted to explore was corruption and, and civil servants and, and that sort of interplay. And I'm curious as to whether this was, this was you making a commentary on, I mean, he, he goes on to describe them as, as, as almost two, as two-legged animals. He says that they're two-legged animals and some of them have fur. I mean, and, and that imagery is... And tails. And tails. That imagery is powerful, you know? Fur and tails in describing a, a certain sector of of governance. Um, uh, well, well, thank you. I. <coughs> it must be said, mm. there are very rotten sections of our society. Mm. Period. Mm. And I don't think that any mm. artist worth their salt that is going to tiptoe around <laughs> that. Um, mm. Is, 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 I don't know mm. uh, how I would relate to such an artist. Mm. There are rotten things mm. in our country, mm. right? Very rotten things. Oh. And um, having said that, mm. there are rotten things everywhere mm. in the world, mm. right? Um, but I thought that as a South African and African, a country south of the African continent, mm. I'll witness these things and write about them. And actually, Nathan Kloma does it extremely well mm. in way back home, mm. in a much more yes, exhaustive yes. way because he goes through Street, every yeah. labyrinth that is there mm. in terms of just the state of affairs, mm. of post-independence governance in mm. South Africa. Mm. But not only that, he actually even takes that through uh, from exile yes. and how you have sub-communities mm. within mm. a society mm. and the nature, evolution and mutation of mm. privilege. Mm. So I would strongly recommend Way Back Home for this thing, mm. which he does it much better than mm. uh, and in a much more comprehensive way. Mm -hmm. You see what I meant about <laughs> contemporaries? <Yeah. laughs> um, so, Miles M has a, a lot of curiosity about, about Michael K. And this is a curiosity that, that sort of extends throughout the book. I mean, people are curious about his, the simplicity of his life and how he lives the way that he, he, that he has, you know, and it continues to the theme. And um, for me, I think people have often been accused of having a, a curiosity about the, li the lived experiences of other people, particularly black people, in a way that almost reduces their, their lived experiences. Um, how would you sort of respond to that, that, that curiosity of, of the characters about Michael K, where he comes from, who he is, why is he this person that lives this solitary lifestyle? What is there an entitlement that the community has to, to Michael K's story, his life? I mean, he often gets asked, what does the K in your name stand for? 
um, and and for me that was just interesting over and over again that there were people who were so invested in in knowing about other people's lived experiences that you you'd even want to write a they'd want to write a book about him you know in the story as it continues and there's all of this interest around that particular character i think michael k is a representative of the answered Mm. and the misunderstood. Mm. He functions primarily as a very metaphorical character mm. from where I am sitting. Mm. But it also speaks to a very silent thing, mm. which is the interdependence between generations mm. of thinkers and writers. Mm. Um, just as an aside, I've been told I don't know how many times that, my God, you've got balls. <laughs> so I have to keep checking if, if, uh, if, if they are still there or if uh, they have changed uh, mm. from how I know them to be. Um, and I don't see what the balls mm. are about. Mm-hmm. And here, just to perhaps clarify for listeners, it's, it's guts, really. Mm-hmm. It's metaphorically that you've got guts that you would approach this very, you know, mm-hmm. uh, esteemed, famous, accomplished uh, work of art. But like I've said earlier mm. in the interview, I think that societies are entitled mm. to interacting with the, the artistic output of uh, their scribes mm. in their totality. Mm. Mm. What, they, what connections they make mm. uh, should not really be of concern mm. for writers. Writing is too much work as it is. Mm. Now to belabor complex explanations mm. and what have you, I think that is that that is not ideal. Mm. At least speaking for myself. Mm. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the the guts that you've been asked if you have, I think that it's come up in numerous interviews that you know um, people have been asking about the, you're right, about the bravado it must take or the confidence that they think it must take to take on a literary subject like The Life and Times of Michael K. But you, you mentioned that you'd read the book numerous times over 15 years, 30 times over a 15-year period. Um, and I'm curious as to why you kept going back to The Life and Times of Michael K. You, you have read quite widely and extensively and have mentioned numerous books that, that have an, an impact on, on you as a writer and a reader. But why was it so profound to go back over and over again to The Life and Times of Michael K.? And I guess leading into that, you've mentioned that you have an interest in the, the reimagining of certain narratives. So you mentioned how you, uh, in an earlier interview, how you were, you were fascinated by the works of somebody like Tando Mnolozana in writing Unimportance, for example. You know, so it could have been any, any book. So the question is twofold. It's uh, related to the life and times of Michael Kay, but also why this particular sort of genre interests you. Um. I shouldn't say too much, but I am not finished Mm. in terms of my interests. Mm. Uh, I would not necessarily write a sequel to another book Mm -hmm. and and, and, and what have you, but I think that it is important to know what you are doing. Mm. So I don't think there's any profound answer Mm. to that. If you're going to be... dealing with a, an important task. Mm. I think a surgeon, for instance, if a patient needs to go for surgery, mm. there is a pre-assessment mm. of whether the patient is fit to undergo surgery mm. and the, the uh, counterweighing of risk, right? And it's a very specialized thing to do. And that is why some surgeries take 12 hours mm. to do. I don't think it's any different from someone who is writing a book. Mm. It's just that it happens that it's words and ideas. And I think that long period of gestation of reading and whatever is not only particular to Michael Kay, it's with literature that I enjoy, mm. you know, that I keep going back to mm. and, and reading. Mm. Because it would be extremely embarrassing if uh, I didn't need to talk about my own work. Mm. Someone said, comment on Zukiswa's work <laughs> or Yawande's work. Mm. Uh, we've got five minutes. The person who was supposed to be here is not here. Mm. Uh, what uh, 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 are your views on, on ABCD? Mm. It would not be fair to have read it of nuance. Mm. It, 
it's, it's proper to read it and internalize it and understand it. Because I might, uh, whether planned or unplanned, mm. need to be an advocate mm. for yes. that particular book, as mm. my peers and colleagues do the same for me. Mm. So I'd like to ask authors how, because we, I mean, the blurb is somebody else's description of your book. I like to ask authors often how they would describe their book to a stranger. So you meet somebody on the Khao train and you get talking and they say, oh, what do you do? Uh, which is a, a favorite question in this wonderful city of ours. Um, and, and you respond, I'm a writer. And they say, oh, what, what, yeah, what is your lesson? <laughs> Oh, what is your real job? What, what do you do on the side? You know, I mean, so I, I didn't ask you about your hobbies. I mean, what's your real job? Uh, but on a serious <laughs> note, how would, you, how would you describe this book to a stranger? So how would you describe Michael K to a stranger? As a lightning bolt. That's how I would describe it. As a lightning bolt. <laughs> It's probably the best description I've heard of a, of a, of a, I've heard an author describe it. <laughs> a lightning bolt with a side serving of Greek salad. You have to read the book to, to get the, the reference. Um, I love that description that you describe your book as, as a lightning bolt. And I, I actually want to just say a very, very big thank you to, to Tigang for coming out uh, on a Saturday morning and, um, being a part of the Cheeky Natives, I think a massive part of what the Cheeky Natives does is is the archiving of, of literature by people who look like us for us and, and the reimagining of what what the literature is, right? What the narrative is. And it's and every time that we have this podcast, it just it just reinforces that that we're doing the things, we're making the parts, we're we're bringing it together. And it's just so powerful to have you to have you have taken on what would have, I think, would have, a lot of authors would have shied away from, you know, reimagining or putting your own, writing your own book, which does stand on its own two legs as its, as its own book, um, of what was a, a Booker Prize winning work, you know. And, and having read Michael Kay, I, I just want to implore everybody to go out and not only read Michael Kay, but also to read Pleasure, to read Rusty Ball, Small Things, to read The Sense of Bliss for the appreciation of what is an amazingly talented talented writer. I think that the fact that your contemporaries are in the audience and nodding um, just a few seconds away from snapping as, as, as we speak is testament to, to the ways in which you are incredibly talented and how seriously you take your art. So I just want to say a very, very big thank you to you and Seeking. It's been absolutely wonderful having you on the podcast. I uh, want to encourage everybody to go out and not only buy Michael K, but also buy all of his other works, as mentioned. Um, like we said earlier, Pleasure was long listed for the International Dublin Literary Award. I mean, it's won numerous awards as well. So we just want to encourage everybody to go out and read the words of T.K. Muslele. And also, do the homework that was prescribed. He dropped a lot of amazing names and a lot of amazing literary recommendations, enough to keep a 16-year-old busy until the end of high school. Um, and so we just want to thank you once again. We look forward to seeing more of your work and seeing more of you. And uh, we just can't wait to see what the future has in store for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I like the name Chiki Natives. <laughs> I think it's very innovative. But thanks for inviting me. It's been a great pleasure. And I have learned a great deal from engaging with you. Thank you. And I'm very privileged that my peers. So, <laughs> We're getting this. Okay. <laughs> so the cheeky natives, um, as reminded by a wonderful guest who got her own piece of land, that's why she's reminding us about this. We have a very interesting rating system. We don't give our authors popcorn and stars. What must you do with popcorn and stars, you know? What we do as the, as the land committee at the Cheeky Natives, which is chaired by myself and Nitlokonolo, who is currently in the US pursuing his masters, we, we give land, we give land to, to, our, to, our, to our guests based on how much we've enjoyed their books, you know, and, and based on things that we've read in the story and, and, and. So based on how, how much we've just enjoyed reading Michael Kay and, and your previous works and the amazing work that you've done, um, as chairperson, 
<laughs> of the land committee at the Cheeky Natives. Um, I would just like to give you the, the, a piece of land uh, in Mauro's Arch. Julius? And, <laughs> and when you read the book, Mauro's Arch features in 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 the book you know so i just think it's only fitting that with you having paid homage to Maro's art mm-hmm. that as chairperson of the land committee we we give you a piece of land and Maro's art for you to go on to pursue your literary interests uh we we can see it happening you know oh, in Maro's art that is wonderful <laughs> coincidentally i was at Maro's art yesterday going to buy food for my baby for my daughter <laughs> so now the landlord cometh <laughs> 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 to Melrose Arc and um, Julius, yeah, we might need to talk. <laughs> you, I mean, you won't even have to uh, to, to speak to to Julius. We we've spoken about this. Okay. We, it's organized. It's, it's organized. organized. Yeah. It's sorted. The chicken natives have said it. The chicken natives have declared it. No, so it is so. No, I wanted to tell him the rule <laughs> the rules from the landlord going forward. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we, we cannot wait um, as the land committee to apportion this, this piece of land. So you are more than welcome to rename it. We would love it if you did. It's okay if you choose not to. But from here on, uh, Maura's Arch is now officially owned by NCK Mulele. So Title deed, people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.